Hey, well, I'm uh, Paul Francis. I spent half my time as an astronomer at Mount Stromlo Observatory and half my time teaching physics in the Physics Education Centre. Um, I do research on comets and why their tails don't point the right directions and uh, very distant clusters of galaxies looking 80% of the way back to the Big Bang and trying to understand how they can possibly be so big so long ago and uh, a lot of stuff on educational research, the best possible ways to teach difficult concepts in physics in a way that students can cope with and actually enjoy. Why do comet tails point the wrong way? I don't know. Um, this is going to be a common theme of this talk, I think. Um, most textbooks, uh, mo most cartoon shows have the tails dragging behind a comet, which is wrong. The textbooks say no, in fact the tail points away from the sun because it's blown away from, by radiation from the sun blows it. So even if a comet's going away from the time the tail will be in front of it. Um, in fact, neither turns out to be quite true. Uh, we, I've been observing some comets, um, entirely by accident, a very long way from the sun, and the tail neither points away from the sun nor drags behind. It actually there's a rather strange curve and points out in front of the comet, then there's a loop around going backwards. And they all do this, and none of the theories can predict it. I've tried every single theory, all the theories in the literature, there are seven theories and all of them don't work. Um, and I've been inventing some more theories of my own. Of jets being squirted out of particular directions and uh, weird forces and magnetic fields being involved. And I can't get any of them to work at the moment. So, um, However, I hope to get back to it when I finish teaching and maybe we'll figure something out. If not, I'll publish a paper saying, this is really weird, no theory can predict this. Where did the universe come from? Um, once again, the answer is I'm <laughs> damned if I know. And I don't think anybody knows. Um, I remember once uh, there was an article in the Australian talking about how this has been this great big breakthrough and now astronomy was all finished. So I wrote a letter back saying, hmm, all finished apart from a few minor questions like you know, what is the universe made out of? Is there life in space? Where did it come from? Where is it going? How big is it? Apart from that, it's all solved. Um, where did the universe come from is probably the biggest and the answer is of course we don't know. We know the universe about 13.7 billion years ago was much smaller than it is now and extremely hot and full of extremely hot boring gas. How it got to that state whether it was God said, let there be a small universe entirely full of hot gas or something else, um, we still <laughs> don't know. Um, we have a, a real problem here in the sense that back then the universe was incredibly dense. You had all the matter we can see in the universe today squashed into about the size of a peanut. Um, and so as you can imagine, the density is very, very, very high, trying to get 100 billion galaxies into something the size of a peanut. Um, and so the temperature and pressure was like nothing you know in the universe today. And so one way you try to figure out what happened then is by slamming things together as hard as you possibly can and try to duplicate the conditions. And they can do that in things like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Of course it's very, very small, but they can at least knock a few atoms together at the same sorts of energies and temperatures. And they can more or less reproduce the sort of behaviour of matter when the universe was about a billionth of a second old. Um, so we have some idea what was happening then. It was something called a quark gluon soup. Um, because the fundamental particles like protons and neutrons we have today didn't exist, it was much too dense for those, so instead everything was made up of particles called quarks and gluons. But what happened before that, say instead of one billionth of a second after the Big Bang, um, one ten billionth of a second or one hundredth of a billionth of a second of a Big Bang, or before that, we don't know, because everything was getting smaller and smaller and denser and denser, so we had the entire universe in the size of a grain of salt rather than a peanut, and before that the entire universe in the size of an atom, and so on all the way back. And basically we can't experiment with that. We've got no, no experiments on Earth that can reproduce this, so we have to rely on our theories, so we have to think deep thoughts. And the trouble with this is there are so two great bunches of theories in 21st century physics or 20th century physics, one of which is relativity, which deals with very massive things. Another one of which is quantum mechanics, which deals with very small things. And normally you never need to use both, because when do you have anything that's incredibly massive and incredibly small? And there are basically two situations. One is black holes, and the other one of which is this time just after the Big Bang. And the trouble is the theories don't mix, they're like oil and water. They predict wildly inconsistent and ridiculous things. So presumably there is some even better theory that can explain both really massive things and very small things. You never normally have to worry about it. I mean, if you're designing a silicon chip, you use quantum mechanics. If you want to know where your space probe is going, you use relativity. You never have to worry about both. There's nothing in our laboratory which tests both. And so we've got the sort of bun fight with people going about who can come up with the most elegant theory. And given there's no data, it's purely done on the basis of, nah, nah, my theory's more beautiful than your theory. And you go to the conferences and that's just what it's like. People complain, oh, that's, such, that's so elegant, that's, that's got to be true. Oh no, my theory, oh, that's elegant as well, that's got to be true as well. And to my mind, that's not science, that's theology. I mean, that's like angels on the head of a pin. I'm an experimentalist and 
my impression is that whenever we get too far beyond experiment, we go wrong, because humans are not as clever as we think we are, and the universe is smarter than any of us. So basically, we don't know, I think. Um, probably something very weird. Um, there are people like Stephen Hawking who work on grand unified theories to try and merge quantum mechanics and relativity. At the moment, there are over 500 rival theories out there, none of which have any data for them. And so we don't know which, if any of them, are true. Um, so to my mind, it's all wild speculation, but you feel free to speculate wildly. There's lots of these things out there. My favorite unsolved mystery. Well, the big ones, like where did the universe come from and what is the universe made of, get all the publicity. But there's also a bunch of fairly small mysteries, which I personally find quite interesting. One that amuses me is that um, where the planets um, came from. Um, originally, you were expecting the planets are supposed to have formed from a whole bunch of rocks orbiting around the sun. And these rocks would have slowly stuck together, so small rocks would have stuck together to form bigger rocks and even bigger rocks and so on until they end up at the Earth. The trouble is these rocks would have been orbiting in the middle of a huge disk of gas, and the friction between the rocks and the gas should have meant all the rocks fall into the sun. So planets shouldn't exist. Oh, we seem to be on a planet here. Mm. <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, so that's a little embarrassing at the moment. That's my, probably my personal favourite unsolved mystery. Um, usually about UFOs. Um, I remember one guy when I was walking in the mountain in America telling me about how the UFOs had swooped over his back fence all the time and they'd told him the secret of perpetual motion and it's magnetism. Uh, only the magnets he could buy from Walmart weren't powerful enough. He tried to reproduce this in the back but they, they just couldn't buy powerful enough magnets from Walmart. So that was a question I didn't quite know how to answer. <laughs> <laughs>